history has no shortage of eyebrow-raising schemes, whether by those on the wrong side of the law, or by lawful authorities, take the CIA scheme to arrange an affair between a Muslim king and a Jewish actress, that produced a dwarf. That wasn't even the weirdest part of the story. Or the scheme concocted by an 18th-century London crook who feigned reform, joined the forces of law and order and used them to transform himself into Britain's biggest criminal. Following are 20 things about those and other schemes and scams that seem far-fetched, but were all too true. The CIA Scheme to Pimp for a King Jordan's King Hussein witnessed the assassination of his grandfather, King Abdullah in 1952 when he was 17. He ascended the throne the following year after his schizophrenic father, King Talal was deposed in 1953. The young monarch struck the U.S. as a potential ally, so when he headed to America in 1959 on a state visit, officials went out of their way to make his visit as satisfying as possible. The king requested female companionship during his visit, so the CIA turned to reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes' right-hand man, former FBI agent Robert Mau. Mau was already a CIA contact, the agency having turned to him to connect them with mafia figures to help with clandestine efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro. When the CIA turned to him for pimping help, Mau did not disappoint, he came up with a scheme to hook up the visiting royal with an actress. The Scheme to Hook Up a King with a Wasp Woman A declassified CIA memo shows that the agency used Robert Mau to find the 23-year-old visiting King Hussein female companionship during an April 1959 visit to Los Angeles, referring to the king as a foreign official, the memo stated, the foreign official was especially desirous of female companionship during his Los Angeles visit and it was requested that appropriate arrangements be made through a controlled source of the CIA's Office of Security in order to assure a satisfied visit. Jordan's monarchy not being exactly top-shelf or A-list royalty, Maho could not get any top-shelf A-list actresses to entertain King Hussein, with the Marilyn Monroe types unavailable. Maho had to adjust his scheme, worked his way down to the B-list. He came up with Susan Cabot, a 1950s B-movie actress who had starred in low-budge Roger Corman flicks such as The Wasp Woman, in which she transforms into a deadly wasp. We want you to go to bed with him. According to the declassified CIA memo, the scheme called for Susan Cabot to meet King Hussein at a Los Angeles party thrown by Edwin Polly, a rich oil man and a friend of Howard Hughes. Cabot was bluntly told before heading to the party, we want you to go to bed with him. As she put it later, Cabot initially declined, but finally agreed to go to the party, though the memo continued. She became quite taken with King Hussein and found him to be most charming. Hitting it off King Hussein and Susan Cabot met on April 9, 1959. There were doubts at the time that the scheme might go awry because of Cabot's Jewish heritage, she was born Harriet Shapiro. Fears that Cabot's background might prove problematic for the Muslim monarch were quickly dispelled, Hussein was smitten. According to a CIA memo, he got along so well with Cabot that when he left L.A. for the East Coast, the king wished to meet with her during his stay in New York City from 14th through 18th of April, so the CIA rented Hussein a house in Long Beach, Long Island, and registered Cabot in Manhattan's Barclay Hotel under an assumed name. A star-crossed love affair the scheme to hook up Jordan's king with Susan Cabot evolved into more than a temporary fling, and led to a star-crossed affair between the Muslim monarch and the Jewish actress. From the start, the CIA's matchmaking scheme was a sensitive matter. As hard as the duo tried to keep the relationship a secret, details began to leak out. According to the declassified CIA memo, during the stay at the Long Beach site, Cabot discussed the publicity in the case at some length with the security representatives, she speculated about the possible sources of certain personal information that, she felt had been leaked to the press. A Royal Love Child King Hussein continued to meet in secret, with Susan Cabot whenever the Jordanian monarch visited America, until the affair ended in the 1970s. By then however in 1964, Cabot had given birth to her only child Timothy. He was long rumored to be Hussein's illegitimate son. The rumors about Timothy's true father were buttressed by the fact that Hussein regularly paid Cabot what seems remarkably like child support, as one of Timothy's lawyers put it in court papers in 1989, 
where as long as I can discover, Cabot received a regular sum of $1,500 a month from the keeper of the king's purse, Amon Jordan. For better or worse, it looks like child support. A Troubled Family Unfortunately, the CIA scheme to play Cupid did not lead to a happy ending. Susan Cabot grew mentally ill in the 1980s and became a recluse. Her son Timothy, who was born with dwarfism, inherited mental issues from both his mother and father. His grandfather, King Talal, had been deposed because he was schizophrenic. Timothy's mental problems were worsened by growing up in a dysfunctional home with a mother who raised him in squalor. The kid grew up in a decaying Encino estate, surrounded by rotting food and stacks of ancient newspapers. Guarded by a semi-feral Akita, things were further exacerbated by Cabot's ill-advised decision to treat her son's dwarfism with experimental hormones extracted from the pituitary glands of dead people. The treatment, which was discontinued in the 1980s, after it was discovered that it gave some patients a degenerative brain disease, did not cure Timothy of dwarfism. Instead, it might have left him with lifelong severe mood swings. A Tragic End Susan Cabot came to a tragic end on December 10, 1986, when she was found beaten to death with a dumbbell. Her son Timothy told police that a stranger in a ninja mask had broken into the house, knocked him unconscious, then murdered his mother. Police and the district attorney disagreed, and charged Timothy with killing his mother during an argument. He eventually pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, raising his dysfunctional upbringing as a defense. In 1989 he was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Having already served two and a half years behind bars awaiting trial, he was sentenced to three years probation. He died of heart failure in 2003. A detective who recovered items he had stolen. William Challoner led an interesting and interestingly crooked life that few can match. The son of a Warwickshire weaver, he was a willful child who showed no interest in the family trade. So his exasperated father sent him to apprentice to a nail maker in Birmingham. Challoner had no interest at that line of work either. However, he did get drawn to another type of metalwork that Birmingham was famous for at the time, counterfeiting coins. He took to that scheme like a duck to water and soon gained an expertise in producing fake groats, coin worth four pence. Challoner headed to London in the 1680s and began selling dildos. He also got started on a new career as psychic and a quack doctor selling fake miracle cures. In addition, he gained a reputation as a particularly successful detective, with a keen nose for finding and recovering stolen items. That success probably had something to do with the fact that Challoner had stolen those items himself, before offering to find them in exchange for a reward. From Penny Ante to Big Time Challoner eventually tired of small-time Penny Ante scams, and decided to get into something far more lucrative, go back to counterfeiting, this time, however, he would do it on an industrial scale. Around 1,690 Challoner resumed counterfeiting, but his days of cloning four penny groats were over. Now he upgraded his scheme to focus on higher-value coins such as English guineas and French pistoles worth about 17 shillings. Challoner established a well-oiled counterfeiting ring that produced fake coins in quantity. He combined that with an efficient distribution system to pass them on to contacts in the underworld for circulation. Before long Challoner had transformed himself into a wealthy, so he expanded operations by purchasing a nice house in the countryside, where the noise of his coining machines would not attract attention. The Scheme to Bubble the Government Challoner added a new scheme to his repertoire in 1693 and became an anti-Jacobite agent provocateur. The Jacobite supporters of the recently dethroned King James II were trying to restore James. Challoner feigned sympathy for their cause, drew them out into treasonous activity, then snitched on them to the authorities for a generous reward. In one instance he collected £1,000 a small fortune, for setting up two Jacobite patsies who were executed. Then Challoner figured that instead of wasting time trying to find Jacobite conspiracies and conspirators, it was easier to simply invent them. In 1693 he informed the authorities that he had discovered a Jacobite plot to seize Dover Castle, and offered to infiltrate the network. He told an accomplice that if he followed his lead, they would bubble the government, who were the easiest to be cheated of any men in the world. The Dover Castle scheme did not pan out so Challoner came up with another, he gave the authorities with a fake list of Jacobites, and got them to hire him to investigate them. Setting up Patsies 
in one of Chaloner's agent provocateur scams, he got an accomplice named Coppinger to write a treasonous Jacobite satire, the scheme was to use that to ensnare a printer into printing it. Then Chaloner could make a beeline for the authorities and turn in the printer, now guilty of printing illegal Jacobite materials, in exchange for a generous reward. There being little honor among thieves, however Chaloner's accomplice tried to hog the entire reward for himself by getting Chaloner out of the way, Coppinger snitched on Chaloner's counterfeiting scheme, and had him sent to Newgate Prison. However, Chaloner managed to talk his way out of it. He even turned the tables on his erstwhile accomplice, and got Coppinger hanged for writing the Jacobite satire. Going after the Bank of England Chaloner's next scheme targeted the newly established Bank of England, which had introduced new £100 bank notes in 1695, Chaloner got his hands on a stock of the right kind of paper, and began churning out £100 notes. He was caught but he got away on a legal technicality. Astonishingly, although counterfeiting coins had long been a capital offense, forging bank notes did not make it into the statute book as a crime until 1697. Chaloner immediately turned King's evidence, state's witness, and snitched on his accomplices to curry favor. He did such a good job snitching that he received formal thanks from the Bank of England, and a £200 reward. He also got to keep all the profits he had made from his earlier £100 bank note forgeries. Isaac Newton, Crime Buster William Chaloner's criminal career was going great, but unbeknownst to him, he had acquired a relentless new nemesis, Sir Isaac Newton. The famous scientist was appointed Master of the Mint, a position intended as a sinecure. However, Newton took the job seriously. He zeroed in on Chaloner and devoted himself to building an airtight case against him. Having one of mankind's greatest geniuses devote himself to bringing you down is bad news for anybody, and so it was for Chaloner, Newton used a network of spies, informants, and investigators who raked through Chaloner's past to dig up dirt. They found plenty. Sir Isaac then had Chaloner tried before a hanging judge. The judge lived up to his reputation, and after Chaloner was found guilty, he was sentenced to hang. William Chaloner was unable to come up with another scheme to save his neck this time. He met his end on March 22, 1699, at the end of a noose on the gallows at Tyburn. The Silver Scheme The East Texas oil field is one of the world's biggest oil deposits, and it made H. L. Hunt, who controlled much of it one of the world's wealthiest men, his sons Nelson, William and Lamar the last a founder of the American Football League, and Major League Soccer, were also super rich. Especially Nelson, who made a killing drilling for oil in Libya. Nelson Hunt was a paranoid crackpot, however, who feared that the U.S. government was conspiring to steal his wealth, in order to protect his fortune, he concocted a scheme to buy a whole lot of silver, and hoard it in Switzerland. Then he decided to buy all the silver, and persuaded his brothers to join him in a bid to corner the world's silver market. By 1979 the Hunt brothers owned about half the world's transportable supply of silver. Then their scheme backfired in spectacular fashion. Rocketing Silver Prices In the 1970s, Nelson Hunt and his brothers went on a gargantuan silver buying spree, when they ran out of money, they borrowed heavily to buy yet more silver. By 1979 they had accumulated about 100 million troy ounces, almost 7 million pounds of the stuff. That was almost half the world's transportable supply of silver. That Hunt Brothers speculation scheme caused silver prices to rocket over 800%, from $6 an ounce in early 1979, to over $50 by early 1980, that made them about $4 billion in paper profits, and if they could have, they would have been wise to take the money and run. The hiccup was that they had created a huge asset bubble, that was bound to burst sooner or later. Selling off their silver stocks would have burst the bubble sooner rather than later. A Global Silver Craze The Hunt Brothers scheme created a global silver craze, as silver prices doubled, trebled, quadrupled, and kept on rising, people around the world began melting silverware. These went on a silver-stealing spree. Tiffany's ran ads attacking the Hunt Brothers' speculation for making silver unaffordable to consumers. The Hunt brothers ended up creating a bubble market for silver, it was a bubble in which the Hunts themselves, as the world's biggest hoarders of silver, were most at risk. Then the Federal Reserve, whose mission includes averting such bubbles, stepped in and issued a rule specifically targeted against the Hunts. 
it banned banks from lending to precious metal speculators. The result was a swift bursting of the bubble. Collapsed scheme bursts the silver bubble. March 27, 1980, was the day of reckoning for the Hunt brothers, that day which came to be known as Silver Thursday, saw their silver speculation scheme collapse. Prices took a nosedive, and the Hunts almost immediately lost over a billion dollars. The Hunt family fortune survived, however, and the brothers pledged most of it as collateral for a rescue loan package. Unfortunately for them, the value of their family assets declined steadily throughout the 1980s. By 1985 their net wealth had dipped from over $5 billion just before Silver Thursday, to less than a billion. Then things got worse, especially for the genius behind the silver hoarding scheme, Nelson Hunt. From Plutocrat to Pauper Throughout much of the 1980s the Hunt brothers managed to hang on, however their luck finally ran out in 1988, when the consequences of their collapsed scheme caught up with them. That year they lost a lawsuit accusing them of conspiracy related to their silver speculation, and were hit with hundreds of millions in liability and fines. Nelson Hunt was hardest hit, and he ended up breaking the record, for the biggest personal bankruptcy in America's history. His assets were seized and sold to satisfy creditors, including his oil fields house bowling alley, and a $12 million coin collection. The Fake Lord 19th century con artist Lord Gordon Gordon was no lord, however he successfully used that aristocratic title to gain entry to upper society circles, and con large sums from the unwary rich. His real name and identity are unknown, but he first appears in the record in 1868, when he posed as a Lord Glencairn as part of a scheme to secure an estate in Scotland. He did not get the estate, but he did get £25,000 from some London jewelers before fleeing to the US. He ended up in Minnesota, where he made a splash, presenting himself at the National Exchange Bank of Minneapolis, sharply dressed in patent leather and a silk hat, as Lord Gordon Gordon. He deposited several thousand pounds from his London loot, and in subsequent days and weeks, he let it be known that he was heir to the Earls of Gordon, and a collateral relative of the romantic poet Lord Byron. It was the start of his next scheme. <laughs>